and uh, welcome also from my side to everybody here. When you walked into the venue through that entry hall and then also here in the lobby, you have seen a few things on display, a few beautiful and brilliant machines. And I, I want to talk a little bit about those machines and about their specifics in the context of the discussion today that we are having. Now, those few pieces of, of equipment uh, are just a handful of them, but think of about a family of easily 250,000 devices GE made that are sitting around the world and sort of waiting to get their entry into a huge social network, if you like. Now, that network is going to consist of men and machines. And I think it's very likely that the next revolutions we talk about in productivity and, and better understanding and driving innovation forward will have to come from the interaction between human beings and machines. And to do this well, you need technology at the end of the day. And that technology has to be developed. So we have made large investments, as we heard this morning, into setting up centers of excellence around the world, essentially, to tackle that challenge and drive technology forward. First and foremost, there's our software center in San Ramon in California. Typically, we find today certainly most of the talent in the internet domain. That is about a thousand people group and still growing. So they are part of a much larger team around the world that works across a variety of applications. 9,000 software engineers in total across the company. Of those, approximately 1,500 just here in Europe. And as I said, it's going across all industries. So you start from, say, here in the UK, Southampton, a team that looks at aviation. You move on to Cambridge here in the UK as well, a team that looks at energy management. Healthcare is a very big piece of it as well. You have teams in Sweden, for example, in Germany and in France. And then ultimately, going further to the south, you will have a large site in Florence that looks at the oil and gas base. So all those people are looking at opportunities to drive that technology within their respective domains. Now let me take you through at least three areas of relevance. First one is, and of course all tied to the equipment you do see, first one is power generation that was talked about today. Second one is oil and gas, and the third one would be healthcare, and then yet at the exit we'll have something else on top. You may have seen the display already, but I'll leave that for the end. This one here, what you do see is, is an aeroderivative, as we call it. Aeroderivatives are variants of jet engines that are basically made to produce electricity, so power stations, if you will. Such an aeroderivative engine, the one that you do see here, has enough power to actually serve about 25,000 homes. So think of it as kind of 30 megawatt size class machine. On this machine sit approximately 180 sensors that look at 1,200 parameters that are critical from both perspectives, operation of the equipment and also the health state of the equipment. So both things are stuff that you want to know. They would produce something to the tune of about 100 gigabyte of data per day. And just see yourself in the situation of an operator of this equipment. You may sit in a control room, but no matter how many screens you put up in front of you, you will not have the ability yourself to follow all of those 1,200 signals that come streaming in from the engine. You don't know which signal to look at. It can be any combination of the ones you have. And the critical events that may occur, you may have not seen before. You may miss them as well. So data analytics capabilities is essential to make sense out of all those interesting signal signals. If we move forward, that is just, as I said, about 100 gigabyte per day for one machine. Look at the complete fleet. Complete fleet, for example, of Yenbacher engines, gas engines that are also used to produce electricity out of natural gas mostly, or biogas, which is one of the specializations of our Yenbacher business. That machine also has lots of sensors on it. The total fleet generates approximately 32 terabyte of data a year. Now, that's just the aggregate of all the data which is being produced. But think of a subset of that fleet, 3,500 engines in total, being connected and directly accessible to people in a control room at a central location to look at their health state. So if you do it right, you can learn from that system and get your maintenance intervals actually fairly extended. And if there's any upcoming issues, you may want to take preemptive measures to avoid anything failing at the wrong moment in time. Sort of like 50% of the field issues that we typically get to see can be handled this way, which avoids, A, for us, great, not having to send a service engineer over, and for the customer having to suffer no downtime for the, for the repair. So that's, of course, a big step forward. Let me jump into the oil and gas space, as I mentioned before. There's two pieces of equipment here. Unfortunately, not a full-size original. It's a little heavy and large. It's a big piece of steel, but at least that model gives you an idea of, of what it looks like. We call this a, a subsea tree. 
It's staffed with technology to control and monitor and make sure that the flow out of the wellhead is optimized in whatever respect you want to optimize it. That thing sits on the ocean floor, maybe 3,000, 4,000 meters underneath the water level, and has to operate for approximately 25 years safely. So to make sure that you don't have any issues, no disruptions, you want to take the data, send them back to the team that is monitoring it, and make sure they have all the tools available to sense very quickly any minor disturbances to normal operation so they can take preemptive measures. At the early stage, it may be curable. At a late stage, if you had a failure, it might be much, much harder to repair that. There's also sensors in it that are, by the way, here produced uh, in the UK, I think near Leicester. As I learned this morning, a wellhead sensor. So those things typically are furnished with lots of sensors. The more you can put on them, the more you can learn, the better it is. Here's another piece, this one in real life, because it isn't all that big. That is a system that is, in a sense, an ear, a giant ear that sits on the ocean floor right next to the other equipment you just saw. And that one is listening to what the equipment has to tell him, or it, I rather say, in a radius of approximately 500 meters. So that means you are listening to sound, you are listening to electromagnetic waves, and from all those data you can infer what actually the equipment is doing around you, rather than using a lot of sensors on that equipment itself. The information is fed back into a control center, and the team at the control center has access to a database that has, should I call it, signatures, has wave signals that are characteristic for certain events. So you can see if a machine is tripping, if a valve is closing, if an engine is working harder than you really want it to work for efficiency reasons or maintenance reasons, and it also can tell you is there any leakages, orders of magnitude more accurate than any specific sensor at that pipeline might be able to tell. So that's a huge advantage. Third point, healthcare. Here is an MR machine. Now, every practitioner, every clinician using MR machine knows that there is a lot of data generated on those devices. But that data is mostly utilized in an embedded form. It's being processed into images, slices, which are then sent out, and people do it. That is the diagnostic side of the thing. But you also have an operational side of the whole story. Namely, your system is meant to run 24-7 if this was needed. At least be available anytime you need that. So avoiding any downtimes is as critical here as it is for some of the other industrial equipment we are selling. Again, connecting the machine, streaming the, the performance data of the machine to the service engineer allows you to take preemptive measures, make sure the machine has the uptime you have guaranteed, and doctors have more time to use the equipment for diagnostic purposes. Lastly, there is a Formula One car. Let me see, here it is. We're very proud and very happy to be a partner of the Formula One Caterham team. That we do produce sensors for cars and for test rigs and for all kinds of purposes. There are sensors of ours in here as well, but in particular, we also have knowledge in how to utilize the data coming out of the sensors, same theme as ever, to make sure we better understand what the specific equipment actually is doing. So this one has, during a race weekend, something like, I guess, 20 gigabytes of data generated approximately 150 sensors, I guess, live data streaming across 800 channels. And then, remember what we said earlier this morning, the power of 1% is very, very obvious in Formula One, right? So if you have a one percentage point advantage in average speed around the race court or in top speed or fuel burn or lifetime of your, of your tires makes all the difference in the world. So that's a beautiful example where a little bit of extra information can help you enormously in winning. In closing, all these machines have a lot to tell. Unfortunately, they do not speak any of the languages you do speak. But there's technology available to make sure we understand what they've got to say to us. And I can only encourage you, walk around a little bit, take a look at the machines. There's more information displayed. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask.